Love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome but by evil, but overcome evil with good. Praise Jesus. Last week, we said that chapter 12 is where Paul started giving us the application of the theology that he was teaching from chapter 1. We've seen how the words, therefore, is connecting the previous messi message that ended up actually in chapter 8. We spoke and explained why there was that gap with chapter 9, 10, and 11. And there we find that the reasonable thing to do after we learn about God's plan for salvation, his justification, the power of the gospel, his eternal plan, which will never falter, the forgiveness of sin, justification by faith, the natural response would be that the believer in Christ will live a life as a sacrifice to him. The appeal was that by the mercies of God, believers present their bodies as a living sacrifice. And we've seen about the importance of our relationship with him. This chapter speaks about the first two verses about our relationship with God. Now today we speak um, about Actually, we started speaking on Tuesday about the relationship we have with one another. 
Today we will start the tough discussion about our relationship with our enemies, with those that we do not agree with, with those that we have a problem with, with those who have a problem with us. And we're going to see why it is so important that we behave as we say who we are. We say we are children of God. We say we are believers in Jesus. We say we are filled by the Spirit of God. We say that we are sealed by Him, and so many other things. And if, if this is true, then the natural fruit of the Spirit will be exhibited, will be demonstrated by the way we live. The emphasis here is about our attitudes. And it starts by, in verse 9, where we're starting our sermon today, let love be genuine. And this is already something to stop and think about. Let love be genuine. And we can ask ourselves the question, can love be fake? Because if love can be fake, then it's hypocrisy and not genuine love. Love is either genuine or it's not. And if it's not, then it is not love. It is hypocrisy. And that's why we need to ask ourselves, how do I love? How do I love my family, my brethren in church, and yes, those whom we consider are our enemies? If love is to be genuine, then the response of being a forgiven person is important. I was blessed even this morning and obviously now when the breaking of bread was about this matter. Because unless we can cultivate an attitude of forgiving, how can we love our enemies? So if I say I love my enemy, and in my mind I have uh, remorse, I have uh, an evil feeling, and I'm, you know, that negative feeling against my enemy, then immediately when I read, let love be genuine, and I ask myself in a mirror to see the truth. Is my love genuine? And I have the habit of harboring whatever I feel against the people or persons that have hurt me, then I cannot say yes, it is. Now, if I want to, and I'm having a struggle, I'm fighting my feelings, that's something else. However, I must start from step one, and I must say to myself, yes, I want to have a genuine love, and I want to love my enemies, I want to do good to them, even if right now I don't feel like doing that. That's being transparent. That's being honest with yourself and being honest with God. The emphasis on attitudes is important because these attitudes show this list of things we've seen and others that we will read today or next Tuesday shows who we really are. Shows who we really are, not 
to somebody else, but to me, if I am genuine to myself. Remember that I must not think that I am somewhere above somebody else. That's pride. And pride always comes before a fall. Yesterday we were discussing, I think it was yesterday we were discussing, yeah, it was yesterday after prayers, I believe, or before, I don't know, um, about the issue of why people fall, why men of God fall. We've had another tragedy this week. Because we put our leaders on a pedestal. And some churches worship their leaders, which is not so. Because even Paul looked at himself and said, I am a servant. We ministers are servants. And the word servant that he uses is the word of a lower rower. You heard me explain that several times. Therefore, if we are going to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit, we must be who we are. Jesus spoke about this when he spoke about trees. And I'm going to see it, say it my own way. An apple tree cannot bear oranges. And an orange tree cannot bear bananas. And a banana tree cannot produce lemons. It produces what it is. And if we are believers in Christ, then we are to produce who we are. The life of Jesus Christ. Is it easy? No. Is it possible? Yes. It is possible because we, although we are human, we have the power of the Holy Spirit in us so we can die for ourselves and live for Christ. It says here in verse 9, let, let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. We live in a world which loves evil, promotes evil. It's making everything upside down. And therefore, it's up to us to hold fast to what is good. We cannot compromise like Max Lucado just did this week. We cannot compromise our faith because we want popularity. We cannot compromise the word of God because we are afraid of what the government can do to us. If we want to know how the early Christian faced the government of those days, read some history, read, some, read the book of martyrs. They faced their enemies, they faced the government who was seeking to destroy them by remaining who they are. Or where? I don't know that I correct the grammar at this time. They were, who were they? They were Christians, children of God. And they would not worship Caesar at all. Do you know what they had to do? So they won't be sent to the lion's or to the stake to be burned alive, all they needed to do was get some incense, some incense, and put it a fire as an offering to Caesar. All the, oh, that's all they had to do, and they will be spared. And I tell you, there are some Christians, or many Christians, if they are faced with that, they do it. But the early church, because they knew Jesus, the early church believed in what they believed. They did not compromise their faith. Put yourself in that position. You're having to have a sentence from the government because you believe what you believe, and you will not deny who you are. I'm a child of God. I have the Bible. And I'm not going to be, be a Max Ricardo or, or the rest. I'm going to be like Paul the Apostle. I'm going to be like Peter, crucified upside down, if possible. 
I don't want to. But I know that we're living in dangerous times. And I know if, if I just put a little inf incense in front of the parliament or wherever, I will be spared. Am I going to do that? And I tell you, we better start praying that it will be no. We will not do that. So we must not, we must not compromise with anything. However, we must hold fast to what is good. Going back to love. Let love be genuine. We have to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the chapter of love. And we say there the behavior of love, what love is and what love is not. And that's genuine love. Agape. Here we don't have agape, we have phileo, brotherly love. Because that's where it starts. And the brotherly love is important because we, brethren, we are to support one another, help one another, encourage one another, provide for one another, support each other. Especially when we see the day coming. It is possible, is it possible to live in this way? Is it possible that we be what the Bible says we should be? Let's read it a little bit. I'll start again from verse 9. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Look at that. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Now, I ask the question. I begin to ask the question. I'm going to ask you another one. How would the church of Jesus Christ be if the church of Jesus Christ exhibit, show, live this kind of life? How would we be relating to one another? We will be supportive for one another. We will be there for one another. We will not grumble at each other. We will not point fingers at each other. We will learn how to help others in their weaknesses because we need help in our weaknesses. Let us not think that we are better than others. I am not better than anyone else. As no one else in this room is better than the other. Because we are all sinners. We, are, we all fall short of the glory of God. We all need the same salvation. We all need Jesus. We all need the same blood. We all need the same Holy Spirit. We all need each other. Because the Bible says we must carry each other's burdens. That word burden is referring to a heavy sack, a heavy bag that the soldiers used to carry. We all have a heavy burden to carry in life. And we need each other to support us in that area. However, when we speak about love, our mind has to go back to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13 teaches us not to, to mention, for example, past mistakes. We seem to hold people accountable for things they've done in the past. Look at a couple, a, at a couple fighting. You've done that exactly when. Yeah, last time, you know, when we were still courting. Oh, yeah. We cannot spoil a perfect good day with something wrong that happened yesterday. That's love. Because when love forgives, then it forgets. 
Imagine how our, our life, how much better it would be if we are able, if we are able to commit ourselves in obeying the scripture. When we serve Christ, we're going to face opposition. No, the devil doesn't want you to serve Christ. Get that in your head. And that's why when it comes for you to serve God, that says there, serve the Lord. Your flesh says, ah, I don't want to. Your flesh will say, but what about him? What about her? That's our flesh. Forgetting that when we serve the body of Christ, we are not serving him or her. We are serving Jesus. The mentality needs to change. That's why it said in chapter 12 in verse 1, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your minds. We must renew our minds. We live in a world which shaped us, been shaping us since we've been born. We went to school and education shaped our thinking. We go to a place of work and that atmosphere, that influence shaped our thinking. We meet with friends, they shape our thinking. We believe a religion and that will shape our thinking. Everything shapes us in a form that is desires. And most of the time, there's the devil. There's only one mold that can shape our minds in the shape that Jesus wants. And that's the Bible. That's the word of God. No wonder the psalmist over and over again and the prophets, they all honor the word of God and call us the light for their footsteps. The strength of their life. The rock on which they build their life. The word of God. The word of God. And therefore, brothers and sisters, because time really flies. We read in verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Now, I know what the flesh wants to do. No one is going to teach me what the flesh wants to do. I have my own flesh to deal with. The flesh says... Have revenge. Do it your way. Call him what you think he is. Scratch his car. Throw some acid on it. Whatever. I know what I'm talking about. But God says repay evil with good. And that's where it starts. My commitment Whatever the mind tells you to do, you go to the Bible and say, but this is what the Bible says I should do. Although every fiber of your body wants to have revenge, you would say, no, I will repay evil with good. That's what God said I should do. After this morning's sermon, someone came to me and said, Pastor, pray for me because I can't stand my manager. Well, normally managers cannot be stand for, you know. That's normal. But, <laughs> but I have my own experience in that. There are two people that you know that are witness to what I'm going to say. They are not here right now. My foreman was my best enemy. We enjoyed 
harming one another. Because he was who he was. He had more to lose than I had. So I, I kind of always had the upper hand. I'm not going to go into details. Kids are here. <laughs> I was referring to you, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? After Jesus pulled me out of that hole I was in, for a time he thought he had the upper hand. And I responded with love. I responded with more work. I responded with more speciality of work. Until the day came and I saw him coming down the stairs from his office, came straight to me. I was preaching at that time. And I said to my heart, here we go again. And he came to me and put his hands on my, so on my shoulders. And he said, how much I have come to admire you. That's what God can do with your managers or whoever else. I didn't have to fill my days off, you know, have to fill a paper three days before or a week before. He said, if you need a day off because of what you do, just give me a call and we fill the paper later. That's how we came. That's how friends we became. And I tell you, this is one of several victories that God gave me to humble me and realize that God's ways are the best ways, that my ways are no good. My way of thinking has to be shaped into the thinking of Jesus Christ. And that's why we have this chapter. That's why we have the following chapters. To realize that if we are believers in Christ, we are justified by faith. How am I going to show the world who I am, who what I believe, who Jesus is? It's through my life. It's through my behavior. We are the light of the world in this dark generation. So God bless you, brothers and sisters. We'll continue this message on Tuesday, Bible study. Um. Uh, I'm ready to contribute with your experience in these areas. And uh, we will all be encouraged as usual and strengthened. The point is not to meet and waste an hour. The point is to meet and strengthen one another. Okay? So we meet here, God willing, um, on Tuesday at 7. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for this chapter. Thank you for this book, which I wish we can start all over again after it's finished. Lord, whatever you have for us, we are ready to do and receive. But help us to live according to the teaching of this book, O oh God. It changed great men who made a name for you and not for themselves. And we want to be the same, Lord. We want to make a name for you so that you will be honored and you will be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen.